on. And yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Paul and Amber, for hosting me. I've had a great visit here so far. Um, I grew up in Dayton, Ohio. It's nice to be in Dayton Street here in um, Madison. And it's fun to be here. Uh, climate smart rice production, I think, meets all the requirements of climate people in the environment. And um, everybody should have had rice before, so it's a pretty important part of our diet. And there's a lot of interesting and overlapping sustainability questions, which fortunately have some near win 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 solutions that I hope I can kind of talk about and convince you about. I thought I would start, or I should always start with my funders. I have a nice array of federal, state, local funders, also private sector Unilever, which makes the Nor brand that you can see there. They have soups and side dishes that are either pasta or rice. If it's rice, it's, it's grown from the county where our research is. So we um, have some sustainability projects with them. It's pretty interesting. I'm also on Twitter and email on the website if you want to get in touch that way. I want to introduce a bit about where I come from, where I am, and, and how I got into rice, which maybe like many of you, I didn't really even know where it was grown in the US. Arkansas, where I live, grows 50% of the rice in the US. So it's more or less equivalent to the amount of rice that Americans eat. Even though we don't grow a lot, we also don't eat a lot, and so we are net exporters. We grow about twice as much in the US, so we have to about half the rice that's grown here. But I did not grow up in rice or in agriculture. I uh, grew up academically in civil and environmental engineering departments, studied hydrology, which is turned out to be part of environmental engineering. I really was interested in the environment. Turned out to include hydrology. Hydrology in California is dominated by evapotranspiration, which turns out to be controlled by plants through transpiration, which got me into the carbon cycle because plants you know, release transpiration as a byproduct of photosynthesis, their actual aim. That got me into the carbon cycle, which was really interesting. I did a postdoc at the University of Hamburg in Germany at their Institute of Soil Science. It's totally natural landscapes. I did research in Russia, so I have this you know, obvious joke that the North Country is quite familiar to me. I did work in Siberia. I worked in boreal peatlands and Arctic tundra systems, and was really intrigued by, of course, the question of the falling permafrost and all that stored fresh organic matter that's been frozen and is now going to be released as either methane or CO2 with great consequences and great uh, dependencies on hydrology for what form it's going to take. I came to Arkansas in the Department of Biological and Agricultural Engineering, and I knew that I wanted to study a landscape that had local importance in the same way that the Arctic systems did or the boreal systems did. And I also wanted to study methane emissions because I have some skills around that area. And, and um, people told me about rice, and I said, okay, let's look up rice. And I turned out to be a, a great place. So at the university, I also teach classes on sustainable watershed engineering, modeling environmental biophysics, and I lead a study abroad trip to Belgium every spring. But we'll find out like this week if, it, if we've got enough students to go there for this year. I also am the uh, faculty advisor for OSTEM, the LGBTQ affinity group, so uh, that's an important part of my uh, role there. I also do research on sustainable agriculture, which I'll talk about today. Um, we also have job openings, and I like to put that first so I don't forget. So I'm hiring postdocs and recruiting grad students and people who are interested. We also, for the senior faculty, have a department head opening <laughs> that's about to go live, and so we're interested in doing a national search as the Dallas Chair position, so there's some nice resources there. It's a beautiful campus that looks especially nice in the fall, like all of many other places in this um, area. A lot of nice trees there. Um, our campus is also closed for cold weather, so it's not like we totally escape the cold, but it will thaw probably faster than fall here. Okay, so great place, the University of Arkansas. Okay, so some information about rice. It's one of the rice fields where we work. I just do that take drone imagery, which is just fantastic. It's a 70 acre field, so really massive. It's, it's zero grade. And, and the research I do is with eddy covariance, which is a micrometeorological technique that does best at flat landscapes that are homogeneous. And zero precision graded um, industrially planted landscape is about as good patch as you can get. Okay, so rice is hugely important to the world. It is 20% of global caloric consumption, so we can't mess with it. It's really valuable. It's also, of course, culturally valuable in a lot of different areas. It represents the irrigation and water needs are 30% of total water withdrawal. It's a major consumer of the Earth's water resources. To create a flooded environment that the rice plants have an adaptation for, they have their their stem is essentially hollow, it's called a rinkama, and it's basically like a drinking straw that allows oxygen to go into the roots through the plants. That also provides a short circuit mechanism for uh, methane that's produced in the soil layer to come out through the plant itself. So it can't be transport of methane. Methane is really important. That 
flooded condition is, is used because rice has that adaptation and most of the weed species that are other grasses do not. And so it's a, basically an herbicide uh, mechanism. But unfortunately, rice is responsible for 10% of global anthropogenic methane, and there's a lot of concern about that. And unfortunately, current methane estimates are uh, sometimes coarse using emission factor approach to this that are difficult to, to deal with the dynamics associated with weather, irrigation, and agronomy. While they're managed landscapes, and that's fun for experimentation, there's also a million different ways to do it. So it's difficult to get a really good handle on uh, methane measurements in these systems. And there's, there's differences. It's challenging to just take data from one part from China to the US, or from the US to Italy, or different places that grow rice, and do it with different practices. So in my research program, and it's in close collaboration with the USDA ARS, Agricultural Research Service, a research arm, um, in Jonesboro, Northeast Arkansas, we have looked at 10 or more rice fields with 20 plus compiled growing season <coughs> data sets from this eddy covariance method by microbiological technique. That's here. I'm not going to explain too much the technique, but I assume some of you have some familiarity with it. We're essentially getting the greenhouse gas fluxes of uh, methane, and carbon dioxide, water vapor, and energy. And we, we're doing that in different parts of Arkansas. So the state. Here is yeah, roughly a square. Um, Fayetteville is up here and at the rice growing region. You can see the Mississippi at the Plain stands out really clearly on the map. But we have this, the sites that I'm kind of responsible for are close to, to Fayetteville, it's three and a half hours, and then up by Jonesboro, we have some other sites there. But across that whole region, we have rice production, also corn, soy, cotton, peanuts, and some other row crops. Um, Arkansas is really unique in having that. And there's a lot of new interest in climate smart commodities, um, and specifically for rice that offers a really neat opportunity because we can play with the irrigation a little bit, change the flooding dynamics, and reduce the methane that's produced. And that's just what my group is doing. So I'll talk about climate smart commodities, I'll talk about opportunities in rice, and then I'll also talk about four new or growing rice production systems. So it's a little bit didactic. I know many of you probably don't know very much about rice production systems, so I'm going to talk about that, and it's also going to be a little bit meta. So I gave a talk last week at a soil and water conservation conference that is the middle of my talk here. So I'm kind of going to introduce that talk, tell you what I, I told people, give you some of the feedback to that, and then talk about these four new uh, trajectories that our research group and, and also the rice growing community in that area are concerned about and interested in or, or that we hope to interest them in. Okay, so, Partnership for Climate Smart Commodities was this gigantic initiative from Secretary of Agriculture, really exciting. They proposed a billion dollars of funding earlier this year. People who work in ag might have heard about this. It's pretty massive, a billion dollars. It's not all for researchers. I see some, some academics <laughs> nodding their heads. Um, it, a lot, most of that money is given to farmers to implement practices. But, it's, but every researcher in ag was very excited about this. It's a great opportunity for Funding. I mean, most of uh, academic calls are like, we got $10 million to do this, and so $1 billion is just extraordinary. And believe me, I heard from every people we're going to buy 20 any clearance towers and do all kinds of different <laughs> measurements. It's not just for on the ground measurements, it's also to set up a whole kind of commodity system. Picture, so picture the rice aisle at the grocery store that you're in. When you're making a decision there, you're thinking about white or brown rice, Thai, Indian. American rice, long grain, short grain, organic, pre-flavored paella. There's a lot of different choices. So how do we add on to that a climate smart label? There's a whole effort that needs to be done to create a commodity market, and that's also what this call is for. You may have heard me say there was a $1 billion call, and those of you who are reading here see $3 billion. They got such a great response, and this is political money, and so the Secretary of Agriculture actually decided Let's fund it at three billion instead of one billion. <laughs> wow, cool, right? I mean, this is an extraordinary opportunity, and they also did it in two different like uh, tranches or opportunities. So the first one was big commodities. Minimum <laughs> funding level is five million. Maximum is eighty or hundred. And then um, the second tranche is around underserved communities. So that generally Black and Hispanic, Native American, uh, veteran, disabled, different uh, groups that are typically left out, or maybe some specialty crops that um, are harder to create, create big initiatives around. So a lot of enthusiasm around that, and it's done really quickly. You know, there's a lot of political changes happening in this country, they needed to get that money spent before maybe a new Congress came into session. So there's 
some interesting dynamics. And spending that much money, even if for the government, is tough because they have to follow some rules about that. So we were happy. To, uh, my group was part of four or five or six proposals, and, and it seems like we'll be getting some work done on two of them. And, and the Secretary of Agriculture, Bill Tack, actually came to the farm that I work at, or that hosts our, our research, to make it some of these announcements. They, they announce the calls, and then they do these events. And the same day, he was in Arkansas in the morning, Colorado in the afternoon, and Minnesota the next day, like really traveling around, hyping. Okay, so the secretary's there. This is really the, the farm where I work. This is the farmer that hosts our research. And some of the other people there are also really important members of there's Rice Millers. This is um, somebody from Ducks Unlimited that actually co-sponsored the grant that we got. So rice lands are important habitat for waterfowl. And, Docs Unlimited and USA Rice, a long partnership of encouraging water conservation practices in the US area. The gentleman on the far end here is John Tyson. And it, it, Tyson is the world's biggest poultry producer. It's also headquartered in Northwest Arkansas. So some of the money went to companies like that. That's also a little bit controversial if they're really in need of, of those resources. But they're trying to create different things. So the secretary was there, made a bunch of announcements. We got to pose with the secretary, uh, some of my research group also. Some colleagues, Angelia Seifert from the University of Delaware, all talked about a little collaboration, was there in town and, and came to the event with us. We also put up a totally like Potemkin uh, Eddie Covarian's tower. So, this fake tower, those of you who know Eddie Covarian's know that, like, okay, this is a uh, solar panel facing sideways and we're not in the Arctic and totally should be in the center of you know, shed. The sensors are like misaligned, there's a lot of cables, but it was something that the dean, who is like off screen in that other picture, could say. And using equipment like this, then Rumpel's group is able to show such and such. So it, they had some kind of prompt to set up. But then we got a call like two nights before. In two days, the secretary is going to be here. By the way, we won this grant. We need you to set up a tower within view of the event and bring your whole group to it. <laughs> OK, you know, cancel all these plans and, and change things around. It's pretty exciting. OK, so that was in the fall. And we're still not contracted. There's a lot of, they were realizing that a lot of people who won this are private companies, and there's rules about how the government can fund private companies without a competitive bid process. So there's a lot of, and how you're actually going to set up what counts as practices. A lot of that money is, so I'm, this USA Rights Stocks Unlimited grant is for $80 million, and they will fund uh, at least 65 million of it will go directly as payment to farmers to implement practices. There's questions about what kind of proof they need to do this. It's, climate smart practices that we'll, we'll talk about our group has helped initiate and we're going to do some of the monitoring of the monitors so they kind of have some, some different private companies that are doing sustainability monitoring and my group is going to do a kind of an assessment of that and implement a, all that in a way of, of how effective and accurate that they really are to hold their feet to the fire with. So in that context of the meeting last week we had uh, this conservation group and they and they put on a, a big annual conference and they had a session on climate smart commodities and I was given the task to set up the scientific underpinnings of what that means. And so the science side and then in the afternoon we had panels from these folks and, and some of the other ones and some of the related commodities. There's mothers on rice and uh, also corn and soybeans, which are even harder because unlike you don't even have a corn and soybean aisle in the grocery store, you have a chicken aisle, so you have to think about what are they eating and how do you manage like the climate kind of smart labeling of it's also cotton, there's organic cotton. Frankly, the only organic cotton you ever think about is when you're buying a white t-shirt or something. Most of the time when you're buying fashion, you don't really pay attention to that, right? So they also have a, a similar challenge, but they all, but there's also opportunities if there's more money in that, in that commodity. Okay. So uh, this is, so now the meta part, this is this is what I, I told the farmer and conservation group about kind of smart commodities. So some of it will be a little bit simple to, some of it will still be new because it's, it's rice and, and other things. So, we talk about the opportunities of climate smart commodities. And that is that landscape management solutions, or also called major waste climate solutions, have the potential to offset an incredible fraction of human um, energy sector CO2 emissions. It's not the only thing we can do, unfortunately. We must deal with our energy system. But this natural climate solutions part is a, it can be a pretty substantial part of the climate change solution. And so there's an opportunity to release some of the burden on our energy system as it also needs to go through this even more challenging transition to take advantage of natural climate solutions. And what are those? Those are driven by taking advantage of photosynthesis. So really fast carbon cycle. Um, we need to just increase the amount of photosynthesis and then we need to keep the product of, those, uh, of photosynthesis around. So in agriculture, increasing photosynthesis often means 
a cover crop, so a wintertime uh, green cover that extends the amount of uh, time duration that you have for the synthesis is happening. It can be planting more trees in places where they were growing or keeping the trees that you have. It can be higher yielding varieties, ways to create more biomass, more root mass, more litter material, which you can then leave in the ground. The region where um, I live and I'm from has much more, or has, yeah, our states with extended growing seasons, longer periods of photosynthesis. This is a map of, or a, a chart showing the average daily photosynthesis across the year. And you can see that we have extended shoulder seasons, opportunities to really grow bigger cover crops <coughs> than in other places, or um, other ways to do that. We also have fertile soils, lots of forests, um, uh, nice weather for growing uh, year round. Okay, oh, so we have the aim to increase photosynthesis. We also need to keep the products of photosynthesis around. In agriculture, that often means a no-till or reduced till system to keep the biomass in the ground prevented from respiration of, of that carbon into CO2. It can also be no burn or low burn, so a lot of the residue of rice production especially is burned on the field at the end of the season, so that creates CO2, but it also releases like the carbon storage potential. Although it depends a bit, quite a bit on the following crop, um, the, like the work that that also burns the custom gas perspective. It can also be in the ag sector. There's a lot of climate smart activities, energy efficiency and renewable energy. There's been a, a great increase in the number of farmers that I work with that have solar panels on their farm. Um, it can be in Arkansas, we have a problem with groundwater overuse because of, in large part because of the rice irrigation. We're taking uh, water from an alluvial aquifer and we're depleting it. So there's cones of depression in the aquifer surface um, that originally would have been 10 feet from the surface, now it's 170 feet. We have farmers switching and needing to switch to surface water, and, and which has many benefits. They build a small reservoir, it has benefits like using less pumping. It also gives them more control over the water because you have the water right there and you can irrigate much faster than the pumps can bring the water up. And there's other ways like tail water recovery, basically using the drainage at the end of the field to pump that water back to the beginning or use it on one of the other fields that you manage. In the landscape sense, in terms of natural climate solutions, some of the important ones are, are nitrous oxide emissions. That's heavily associated with agriculture. At least half of them into emissions are from agriculture. And that, also represents a waste product of excess nitrogen application that, that the farmers would really like to go into the root zone to uh, feed those plants and increase their fertility and growth. So that's a waste product. And then in rice, we have an opportunity to do aerobic, that means um, oxygenated rice irrigation systems to reduce methane emissions. And there, we're talking about solutions with titles like alternate wetting and drying, which is just what, <laughs> rather than continuously flooding the field during the summer, you introduce dry periods. These aren't really dry, dry. They just mean not inundated. Periods that allow oxygen to get into the root zone. And it actually takes a, a substantial time for the microbial community to start creating methane again. So you reoxygenate a few times and you can really substantially reduce methane emissions. Another one is furrow irrigation, which is basically um, the same way that we irrigate corn and soybean surface irrigation. Running the water down furrows um, also has a lot more but I'm sorry to interrupt. Do you, is there any research done on um, uh, technological advances in the rice plant itself? There is kind of feeding breeding and yeah. There's there's a lot of work being done on different varieties and cultivars that hasn't been a priority of past breeding efforts. And but there, it's known that some varieties allow less methane to be emitted, and, and it's thought to be in different allocations of root to shoot biomass and different structures of the arachnid. Um, so people are looking at that, but um, yeah. I think also you can outgrow it in some way. If you if you re you can if you grow more rice, then you can produce the same amount of rice on less acreage, and then you have less acreage under irrigation. So there's several ways for that. Um, that's that's really important. Okay, so what's interesting in rice? This is work from my group, of my former postdoc. Or my current postdoc, actually. My former postdoc is there posing by a, a combine. My current one is the too. Okay. Um, this is looking at the kind of life cycle assessment light or farm sustainability tools assessing where is the greenhouse gas burden of rice production. And um, what's really interesting is this rice methane, this paddy produced methane, represents 60% of the, of the 
greenhouse gases from rice production. When you have equipment that looks like this, which I don't even know how many gallons per mile this is, and you have multiple farm operations and the embedded um, energy associated with the fertilizers and ag chemicals that you're putting on there, the nitrous oxide story is pretty low, even all that pumping from the deep groundwater I just talked about, post-harvest you have to dry the rice to certain, um, these are massive grain bin field operations, all passes of that are negligible compared to the paddy methane, in part because methane is 30 times more focused in greenhouse gas than CO2, so it's really important to bring that down. This was a vivid demonstration for a lot of people in my audience. So, um, that means that we really need to focus on changes to irrigation practices or other things that reduce the paddy methane emissions. And so my group has also shown robust evidence that supports alternate wetting and drying irrigation. So we did a three-year experiment, paired field experiment, with eddy covariance on each of these neighboring fields under different years. And we had, um, this is cumulative methane emissions over the growing season. We had three uh, cases which were flooded, three cases which were under this alternate wetting and drying. And with some statistics accounting for field to field differences, we could show that alternate wetting and drying reduced methane emissions by 64% with no differences in the yield. That's pretty special. So we have a real opportunity to do that um, globally, and we could get, you know, that 10% of uh, anthropogenic methane from rice, we could get really far down. So there's a really neat opportunity there. Um, it's not good for every field. Often, you know, you wonder why. I wish I owned a rice field so I could implement AWD. And it's not so straightforward. There's cases where it's not, where there's weed pressure that you need to have the continuous flooding or some other diseases and problems. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of those later. Okay, so now that was presenting the opportunity. And so last week I, I then said, how do we create a high integrity approach to climate smart commodities? What do you need to know to be able to put a label on a package that says this is a climate smart commodity? And unfortunately, you have to do monitoring, reporting, and verification. So there's a lot of work being done in a lot of different areas for how do we do that. We can take advantage of things like my colleague in Illinois, Kai Wan, has a system of systems, a lot of satellite, um, data-driven, on-the-ground data, tying to uh, what you can see from space, mobile sensing, uh, gold standard, eddy covariance, paired field experiments like mine, and then tie that to hopefully reporting that farmers are already doing for other practices. So for the NRCS, the Natural Con uh, Resource Conservation Service, and other things like it, farmers are already filling out various forms. And our hope is to layer that and, and ease the reporting burden as much as possible. We also need to address concerns such as these three buzzwords, additionality, leakage, and permanence. And I imagine each of you knows what those words mean as just sort of what they mean in English, but in this specific context, they're pretty specific jargon. And so the next three slides help define what those are. And those are really big concerns for setting up a climate smart commodity. So the first one, additionality, means additionality over a baseline. How do you say that your project is responsible for how much methane emission production or, or soil carbon storage. That's how much, yeah, so how do emission reductions go beyond what would have happened without you? Are they additional to current trajectories this idea, or current practices? And how do we define the baseline in a fair and equitable way? And also maybe a changing way. So the real idea of a carbon market is how do you assign that uh, credit to that, to that practice when, the change, when there was already a trajectory in a positive direction. So if we're on this path, how do you say that you're responsible for this much? And, and who cares might matter different, or might be different depending on the actual use of this. So for carbon offset markets, where there's a high responsibility for getting the carbon credit right, they might care, or they should care more. You may have seen John Oliver talk about how, and others, there's a lot of complaints about how those are really put up in part because of for product labeling, you might just hear that they're a good family farm, I want to support them. The, the burden might be different in terms of the accuracy needed. Um, and, and there's a lot of challenging ways to think <coughs> about, about how that works. Okay. The next one is leakage. And that means that the benefits are not going to leak out somewhere else. And in this, in practice, that means that we don't cause increased emissions somewhere else outside of our project boundaries. And that occurs when the effects of the intervention fall outside the current boundary. Okay, so what does that really mean? What are questions that you can ask? Does implementing this practice say increase fuel use? If it takes 10 more passes of that giant combine, 
how much you know um, more fuel use is that going to be that offsets the benefit of an ethylene emission reduction? Does it reduce harvest yield? So if you reduce rice production here, you're just going to plant another rice field somewhere else and create that ethylene in another part of the world, right? That's not what we want either. Does that practice increase emission of other greenhouse gases, unfortunately? When you um, add oxygen to a soil that's nitrogen rich, you end up with nitrous oxide. And so we need to make sure that our um, methane emissions reductions aren't contributing to too much increase in nitrous oxide. So there's, all, and, or CO2 uh, creation or changes in biophysical properties that can be affecting global warming. So, in other words, if we zoom out, does the atmosphere in total still see an emissions reduction that we can have in the project? That's really difficult. It also, to me, drives a need for continued fundamental research. We need new rice cultivars that are going to be um, higher yielding or agronomic research to help figure out how to do this in a really good and defendable manner. Okay, the last of those three buzzwords was permanence, and that tends to be more important when we're thinking about carbon storage. So carbon storage in the soil or vegetation. How long is it going to last there? How do we get payments to people for something today that you need to prove 100 years from now is still going to be there? <laughs> They're all going to be dead, you know? So, how are we going to manage that difference? It's really a challenge. Um, and there also needs to be protection against um, unforeseen, although I guess we could foresee, but we just don't know exactly when and where they'll happen, uh, events like fire, flood, and drought, or changing practices. If somebody else buys the farm, how do you prevent them from tilling it up if they're not getting any yields anymore? There, there needs to be some kind of safeguards in there. There's often kind of pooling of landscapes or saying only giving people 80% of the credit so that you account for some of the risks. The word uh, reversals is also used there. Okay, what's particularly great about the methane emission reduction story is we don't really have to worry about permanence. It was just never created in the first place. You don't have to, it, it, there's no 100 year storage of methane somewhere. You're just, it's never there. So in that part of the story, we don't have to worry as much about permanence, but unfortunately emissions reductions are also not sufficient to create that green wedge of um, natural conversation. So we still have to take care of permanence. It's just tends to be in other lands, other types of crop systems or forest systems. But it, and it also, yeah, it should give kind of preeminence to the emission reduction story, at least in the short term as well. Okay. So in summary, from my talk last week, I, I do have more to say today, um, we have some great opportunities in Arkansas with the photosynthetic potential. And I really push that we have a high integrity, science-driven adaptation of new kind of smart commodities that we really want people to be able to trust, like Arkansas branded. And I am not a marketing expert. I just replaced the K with a C for carbon in Arkansas. And I thought, let's have a climate smart brand. And probably somebody, I hope somebody will do a better job than, than that. But I think that we would like to have some kind of climate smart that really, because I think a lot of people, when there's a new market, there's going to be a lot of playing a game, you know, and there's people who are going to pretend they're really sustainable. Many of the farmers I talk to were already sustainable, you know, and to me, that's, no, that's not even possible. It's a trajectory, it's a spectrum. Like, and so it's, well, we'll see how how well the market really trusts it. And I think you need to have a, a high integrity system. We also need to pay attention to those three things that I talked about. So the questions I got back from the audience, so this is a quick um, kind of display. The first one, very typical, how are we gonna compensate farmers for these risks? That's a really great question and really challenging. And, and the kind of $3 billion goes quite a long way towards that. Some of the pay to practice um, are going to be up to $7,500 dollars per acre, which many of you, that means nothing. Like, you don't know a farm budget. <laughs> but typical NRCS practices might be 10 or 15 or $20. So if we're talking about you know, five to 10 times as much for this, that should be a pretty good compensation. There's also different ways to do it. It's not necessarily just pay to practice. You can also do insurance policies, yield warranties will really like, you have a guaranteed income in terms of at least 90% of the average of the last five years. So there's some really innovative financial mechanisms that are going on to do that. One of the other people asked me, what about early adopters? The fear basically being the farmers I work with have been in alternate wedding and drying for years. Their baseline is already so high. What else can they do? And would it be better for them to stop doing alternate wedding and drying for a few years, reset their baseline in a, a terrible emitting phase, and then implement it again? They already know how to do it and get credit for that. And, how, and does that strike anyone as fair? 
you wouldn't want to buy rice from people that you knew were playing this kind of game of resetting the baseline, deliberately emitting, or retilling their fields, and then finally doing cover crops, even though they did it through the 90s. You know, you really want a high integrity system, and so some of the ways that people are setting the baseline is not on a field by field basis, but it could be compared to your neighbors or uh, a look back period to account for previous implementation of practices. There's a lot of, that's a good question to ask people who are really in the kind of social economics of this space is, is what about those early adopters? Because, and I hope the high integrity thing to do is to somehow reward them for being, they were ahead of the curve. We couldn't get the money then. They were experimenting. They were helping laying the groundwork for all of this. And they should have a chance to benefit from that. And so I hope that they can be really included in a really positive way for this. But they, what they absolutely should not do is retail their fields or do whatever kind of messy thing. Because we do have some satellites watching and also the kind of ethical uh, standards there. So it, was, it prompted a good discussion. And, and in the afternoon, I think that when we had this panel, a lot of the folks deliberately said, Speaking of permanence, da, 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 or speaking of leakage, we're dealing with it in this way. So there's a lot of exciting momentum in this kind of scenario. In our group, we're also thinking about a number of, of different practices. So um, this one of our eddy covariance stations with one of our technicians there. So we have, I have four that I want to kind of quickly touch on. Some of these are probably new words. So for irrigated rice, I mentioned briefly. Retuning rice, we actually talked about this morning. Um, that's the, that's from a Spanish word called retonio, which basically is the, is the regrowth. So the rice is growing back in the same way that you're, you don't have to mow your, you mow your lawn more than once in the summer. Rice as a grass can actually regrow and create a second crop that's called a retonio crop, and that's kind of interesting. Then we have a fish rice co-production system, and then the last one is a husk amendment. The rice that actually comes in a husk that um, is not just the, and that within that is the brown rice, and then you mill off the brown, the brown, and you get the white rice. So the husk is, is generally a waste product, and we're thinking about using that on the field instead. So um, for a little context on furrow irrigation, we have alternate wetting and drying. It's a great case, it told you it saves 64% of methane emissions. I've seen almost no it. It gets so depressing. We studied this great win win opportunity. It also saves water because it allows rainfall capture when the rain comes through um, the, the dry period. And it, it's stayed at 3% the whole time I've been a professor there in Arkansas. And it's not really changing very much. I've had farmers tell me, the ones who tell me they're already sustainable, will say, we will never do all the Okay. Why don't they say that? There are, it's a challenge. So basically, they. They kind of often irrigate. It takes more more mental energy and work. So and, and the farms aren't necessarily plumbed well for it. So they the typical thing would be like irrigate this field and then that field and then that field. So if you then have to go back and say that that one's not quite ready, and so I'll skip ahead and then go back to it, and you end up like doubling up or bunching up the the need for irrigation. And so it, re it it's not impossible. It just requires a little bit of additional infrastructure. So hopefully some of those payments can be geared more towards like enabling infrastructure that changes pumps and canals and those systems to allow it to happen. It also, like, there is farming in the US is like 10 people will be responsible for 10,000 acres. So you don't have a lot of time to go, like, is it dry enough? Is you know, Ben getting his methane emission reduction? OK, now I'll reflood it. They kind of, like, it's like you turn the tap on Monday, turn it off Tuesday, change it to this. And so it is tough to change these practices. And I don't mean to be flipped. It, it is a really challenging situation to manage all of that production. But what's happening, and this kind of caught the scientists by surprise, is that furrow irrigation, this surface flood irrigation of rice, has become extremely popular in the same time period. Unexpectedly, people started experimenting with it, and it's a lot easier in a lot of cases to implement furrow irrigation than the traditional paddy irrigation. People are familiar, if you're doing a rice soil rotation, you already sometimes even have furrows that you can reuse. The physical construction, what I haven't shown a picture of is, is levees in the field are, are pulled up uh, by a machine. You have to drive across on the contours, um, pull up a levee from the soil around it, and physically dig out a gate to allow water to spill from paddy to paddy. And that takes a lot of land prep, time, equipment, and also uh, physical energy. And so they're willing to take a, a hit on yield even for row rice because it's a lot less uh, physical labor. 
do that. And it's something they're familiar with. And so that actually creates um, a situation where basically, well, it's very flat, but you still have some topography. And so on that upper part of the slope where they're putting in the water, you essentially have a continuously offset zone. And the bottom of the field and the low elevation areas is where the, the flooding is. And so rather than kind of having periods of time where it's toxic and not anoxic, here we have periods of the field. And so there's that's also tough to study because you have a gradient that will change based on the soil conditions. And everything. But on the bottom, you probably have some methane emissions. On the top, you really don't. And so that also creates challenges for some of the other management. They sometimes have to double fertilize on the top or, and um, do different weed management practices. But, but it's grown a lot. There's a lot of real interest in further irrigation. So one of the things we're doing there, and this is with colleagues uh, University of North Texas, also here at Wisconsin, Tyler Lark and Yan Claude Chia, we're working on creating maps of irrigation status and type changes to help identify where and under what conditions people are switching to for irrigation. So we're doing a lot of work on um, different aerial imagery. These are kind of small images, but you can see the contour levees like on the ground and on space. They really just look like contour lines. We're really putting it there, and then there's some kind of Decision leveling, so it's really consistent slopes that are called straight levy systems, which are more uh, water efficient than the contour levees. And then we have zero grades that I showed you earlier that's truly as flat as a table. Then furrow irrigation looks a little bit different. And then there's center pivot that's very rare in rice production, maybe 1% of rice in Arkansas is elevated. It's something that's also quite easy to identify from space. It's a good thing to at least uh, train your algorithm. With. And so we've done some work on that to identify contour levees, and now we're having a lot of students do labeling of images to create algorithms to detect further irrigation and, and some of those other things to help underpin some of the future modeling work that we'll do around that in emissions and, and water conservation. Okay, so the next practice is we're tuning rice, this regrowth story. They basically cut off the rice at a certain height, reflood it, and let it go back. And um, there was a paper a few years ago saying that retuning is currently done in Louisiana and Texas. And as we look at future climates uh, trajectories by 2100, um, it's possible that as far north as the whole rice production region, that conditions will be suitable to retune growth. So basically now in Arkansas, it's generally too cold. It, the, this season we did it, they planted April 1st, the earliest that you're basically allowed to plant rice, harvest it. Um, mid-August, and then kind of rolled the dice, did a retune crop for us, harvested it in November before the first freeze, which would have totally killed that crop. And, and, and so it's a common practice further south where we don't have the risk of an early frost at that time. And so we were able to measure, it was a nice thing that came out of 2020, up here, um, where we have our two fields, they were both under the retune harvest, and the methane emissions from the different fields, we had different degrees of alternate wetting and drying, and the main thesis of the uh, methane emissions a bit different there. But you do see a, a higher methane emission from that return period. You have fresh organic matter that fell to the ground and then it's immediately flooded. It's a hot condition. And so there's a climate risk to this, but there's also a food benefit. We're getting kind of a free second crop as a consequence of some methane emissions. And so there, I kind of want to just uh, do through a little bit. Um, we have a higher yield normalized methane emission. The yield was about 10% of the original main season, but this was for farmers who weren't even anticipating return yield, they weren't doing a variety, they had no experience with it, what pipe you cut it. There's a lot of kind of technical agronomic details that they were working out. But, but the idea is that in theory you could optimize a return period, get a, a free yield second crop, not very much human, but and hopefully find ways even to do alternate wetting and drying during that period or some other things to reduce the methane burden. But we also found this is still a tenth of the methane emissions that were reported from like one chamber study in the 90s on the emissions. There's very little work done on that. But retuning systems are also coming back in, in uh, central China and uh, we'll talk today they're, they're common in parts of Iran. So they are used around the world, but um, that's kind of a unique system. Okay, we also have done a little bit of modeling both in using that year and others. My grad student um, is looking at how to relate, like create farm-friendly metrics of um, methane emissions, uh, to pre or to predict methane emissions. So if you're looking at the length of the flooding event and, and the methane emissions associated with that. So basically accounting for the accumulation of methane, the accumulation of time under inundation drives a greater and greater increase in methane emissions. 
And that relationship works also when we include seasons where the whole season was flooded. And then adding the return points to it in red here um, show it that an increase above that, like a doubling. So we would imagine some kind of doubling emission factor to be added to that. OK, two more practices, just really uh, quickly. This current winter, we're doing a cool project with a nonprofit from California called the Resource Renewal Institute. That's a, a rice fish co-cultivation system. So they had nice press in California. They were growing um, salmon. And so they were talking about the sushi, rice, and salmon growing together. It's very charismatic. And they came and they said, well, 50% of the US rice production is in Arkansas. Let's go there. We somehow got connected. And they put fish in our fields. So the common winter practice in Arkansas is to flood your fields for waterfowl, those uh, birds and ducks, this hunting, its habitat. And here we also added fish. We actually added 2 million minnows, little darters, to our fields. It's really small. And uh, it's a kind of cool ecological story. It's also an opportunity for an advanced protein source. So that the, they're going to harvest the fish in a week or two. And we'll see how many they get, how many of those survive. It's also, I'm nervous about the waterfowl eating them, but we'll see. There's an ecological story that came out of limnology studies in, in like Finland or Sweden or somewhere. That, would, that also did experiments with and without fish. And basically, the fish eat the zooplankton that would have eaten the methanotrophs, which are the microbes that eat methane. Right? And so the methanotrophy can continue because you've killed a lot of the zooplankton from the fish. And then the, you can also get this extra protein. So you're starting to cut off that link in the biological chain. So there should be methane benefits. I haven't, we don't have great, great data on wintertime methane fluxes. We have solar panels. And <laughs> and um, there is some alternate wetting and drying that just happens. So there's not, a, and it's cold, so there's not a lot of methane emissions, but there's something. It's sometimes up to 20% of the summertime methane emissions that can happen there. But this would be an opportunity to have a climate smart wintertime practice. It also increases the productivity of the whole So we're still analyzing the data. So far, we haven't, we haven't been able to, to really get a good idea to see what the difference is on the methane side, but, but we're collecting some of the fish data. Okay. The last little innovative project I'm doing is with colleagues at Delaware and Cornell, and that's to, that's this other dirty secret in rice, which is that it's um, the number one dietary source of inorganic arsenic for small children who are basically too young to eat other sources of arsenic, like uh, seafood. And so um, new parent blogs often complain or talk about rice as a source of so rice-based baby food and rice paste for a common. Uh, food for kids, and, and so, and, and generally, you know, it's a, it's a, obviously, a, it's like the world's most famous bad thing to eat, it's arsenic, and, and we don't want to do that. And, and, and so there's a lot of concern, right, full concern about arsenic and, and rice, and especially that's common in uh, more of a concern in places with diets that are really rice rich. Um, and so we're working on a, a number of different strategies. Fortunately, arsenic is more mobile under flooded conditions. So when we do this alternate wetting and drying, we actually significantly reduce the arsenic migration or migratability into the grain. So in addition to winning the water story and the methane story, you can also win the arsenic story in this practice. So then it becomes win-win-win. Unfortunately, as with all things with applied geochemistry, we knock down the arsenic and the cadmium becomes a little bit more mobile under oxic conditions, and that's also a contaminant. Um, Arsenic levels in rice are much closer to the human health concern level than the cadmium level, so we're not super nervous about that yet, but it's possible that if we would totally switch to a low arsenic system, that we would be delivering a higher cadmium system, and there's totally different diseases, and we're going to do some modeling around that. So the idea of this grant is to look at the water uh, side, but we're also looking at an amendment. Rice husk is silicon rich, and um, there's a lot of evidence that the um, arsenic comes into the plant by using the silicon transporter pathway. Silicon is, an, is a plant nutrient that's especially important for grasses. And actually, when you walk through a rice field, it cuts you because of the amount of silicon concentration. It kind of feels like glass that you're walking through. Okay. And so the idea is that the husk can amplify kind of positive effects, outcompete arsenic into the grain. It also, because it's a nutrient, it can help the, the plant survive, like the drought stress potential of alternate wetting and drying and some other things. So my colleagues at Delaware have these like little rice mesoplasmins. It's not a right producing state, but in the research environment it is. And they looked at different forms of, of silicon uh, from rice waste products, straw and husks. 
So the straw, the husk, and the biochar versions of both of those. We've got a random uh, experiment there uh, to test some of these things. And we ended up deciding on fresh husk additions, which we were going to test in 2020 and then 2021. And you can guess what happened then. We didn't want too many people out in the field during COVID time, so we did it finally this last summer, where we implemented this husk addition. The great thing about husk as a source is that it's produced in the same place that the rice is. So you just basically go to the mill, ask for the husk, which they're like landfilling and getting rid of, they don't want, and bring it back to the field and put it onto the field as an amendment. Um, I think, yeah. We also did, we also did an experiment looking at, at straw, um, where basically straw adds so much of a methane bur burden <laughs> that it's really challenging to use that effectively. Even though it has a lot of silicon in it, the husk is a better, a better source for that. I'll go on to these pictures, we did this cool experiment with our farmer and, and our um, scientists. You can see this is a bag of husk, a uh, modified manure spreader, and postdoc, and, and our farmer helped us till it into the ground. And we, and we built boardwalks this spring to go out into the field and do chamber measurements and rice grain sampling and all that kind of stuff on uh, systems where we amended it with, we had a control with one year equivalent of husk, like the amount of husk from that plot look for that, and then two years of us, so like a double amount of that to look at the impact. And we know from the lab and from the experiments in, in Delaware that that will have a significant impact on the, on the arsenic concentration in the grain, and we don't have those results back yet from the field experiment, but I'm pretty sure that they will show that. <coughs> what we are nervous about, and our group measuring the greenhouse gases is the impact of, of that on methane emissions, and there you actually do see that the, um, the more husk, the more methane emissions. And we also have the situation with um, higher nitrous oxide emissions under the alternate wetting and drying phase. But um, we're, we're still working through some of that data, but, but it's, these are still really low numbers in terms of methane emissions. So we had like some alternate wetting and drying happening there, and, and it was freshly rotated into rice, which reduces the methane burden there. And so it's, it's to kind of make sure that adding this organic material didn't make it so bad in the methane side that it's not worth doing from the arsenic side. So it's kind of really looking at the that crop and the field as a system. Okay, so take home messages, we're thinking about all these different things, carbon, water, and harvest, and, and there's really some nice opportunities in Arkansas and elsewhere for methane that's also water friendly, arsenic friendly, or like friendly for not bringing arsenic into the grain. We're doing this test around husks and some other things, and we do have a lot of answers that are available, and, and part of the interesting question now is how to make them also encouraging to farmers and to let green, environmentally minded consumers also value that and, and think about how to add a label to what is it really going to do. In the meantime, you know, a lot of the motivation for climate smart commodities is really coming from corporate sustainability initiatives and commitments, where it doesn't really matter if the consumer cares, the company's already made a commitment that they can use this to help um, create and support there. So yeah, we just, I, might, I think the main point is that we need a holistic systems perspective on landscapes and thinking about smart ways. That's pretty portable to other crops, of course, it might be different, but there should be this kind of kind of smart opportunity all around us. Thank you. Thank you. of a two-year amount of husk. So we basically added like double the husk that would have been removed from that plot and put it back, and then we've measured it one basically time. Basically, you double the rate. We double the rate, exactly. Okay, and then our question is that when you add the husk, um, did you like, incorporate it into the soil or is it just a surface? Right, so we did a light incorporation, so like the top 10 centimeters um, tilling. Do you know how long before you flood it? We did the husk amendment in November, and then it was, some of the fields were actually winter flooded, and so we were a little bit nervous about it floating away or wind uh, blowing it away. But we did see differences in the pore water concentration in the following summer, so we think that enough of it survived to do that. So I would stress that, that this is very preliminary, thinking about the rates, the dates, the me methods of incorporation, a whole like, 
system will have to be set up for this to be put on a, on a larger scale. Like the mill currently throws it away, they'll somehow need to do a way to save the, the husk, the farmers will need to trust that it works, we need to make sure we're not transporting wheat seeds with it, and there's a lot of kind of big picture things that need to change, so this, this is probably earlier stage than some of the other work that we looked at, yeah. Right. Thank you so much. There is a question online. Um, are there opportunities for genetically modified rice to also reduce meth uh, methane release? Are there opportunities for um, genetically modified rice? This is a really interesting question. There for sure are. There's always an opportunity for genetically modified things to do things. U.S. <laughs> rice is famously non-GMO. So, and in fact, but but maybe not totally because in the in the 90s or 2000s, we accidentally sh sent a shipment of rice to Europe that got caught with some GMO uh, rice in it. We got banned from the European market for some time. And so the farmers are like, we are never doing that. All they, they have the equivalent of Roundup Ready, but for a rice product um, that they got through a conventional pathway. And so they are very careful to not do GMO rice in the US, but I think that it's probably going to come at some point. Erie, the International Rice Research Institute, is working on um, C4 rice, which would be a totally different kind of rice, you know, photosynthetic structure. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for GMO, whether it's whether it's to create higher yields, which that means we can use less land, or to, to change the, the root shoot grain ratios and reduce the methane. I imagine there's uh, projections about climate change in terms of precipitation, maybe you know, theories of drought and whatnot and on and on. How do they mesh with some of the strategies? Are, do some of them go kind of step in step with the strategies that are proposed and others make certain strategies less attractive because of that on the horizon? That's a great question. So, and actually this region, the farmers are like, I eh, mean, eh, it's confirmed by some of the reports. There hasn't been terrible changes in some cases. Like the summers aren't actually as hot as feared in other places and, and stuff. So, so that's a little bit of, a, of an interesting question. I think it's definitely making storm variability more, more common. A lot of the water saving practices work because they enable rainfall capture. So this past summer, we had almost no rain from like early July to late August or some, some really long period. And our other studies on water conservation practices and their effect with the experiment versus control showed no difference because they still need that same amount of water to, to let the plants um, expire. In. So um, that would be a challenge. Other ones with um, bigger winter um, fall hurricanes, those can sometimes reach not as hurricane strength normally, but as big storms in late August in Arkansas. If they hit, they can cause massive crop damage right before harvest. Thank you. Yeah, I was curious about of what the potential feedback to local climate by changing the, uh, by taking the you know, the for example, by, by changing the surface energy balance. That's right. That's a really good question. The change to the energy balance of the surface with AWD. Our, my grad student had, had a paper that there was basically no difference in ET rates between mm -hmm. AWD and not AWD rice. It's basically so transpiration dominated. It's near a potential ET anyway. They're also surround, they wouldn't be simultaneous dry downs across the whole region at once. It would be kind of checkerboard. They're in regions that are already pretty wet with um, wetlands. So I don't anticipate a huge change. It is a good question. It's also a good question from a grain quality perspective because nighttime temperatures, if they're too high, can cause the grain to be chalky. It breaks more easily and doesn't mill as well. And so there's fear that by not having that protective water layer, the temperatures at night would increase. And so far, we haven't seen that relationship, but it's something that a lot of people are keeping their eyes on. So we'll, we'll um, kind of stay tuned, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Am I up? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, my question, I guess, goes to the brief point you made about um, overconsumption from the aquifers. And it kind of stuck with me today because I think they're deciding on a new decision for the Colorado River as well right now. I guess my question is how does industrial scale farming fit into social fabric? Like we're talking about sustainability. It's kind of been a hard pill for me to swallow, like growing up and learning about our water use and being like, huh, <laughs> it doesn't really work. 
That is a really tough question. The challenge is that if we don't have it, where are we going to grow that food? Probably somewhere else with equally challenging social and environmental fabric. And so I think that the industrial farmers do have an opportunity first. I'm more willing to play with an industrial farmer's practices than a subsistence level farmer in rural Asia or someplace. So I think they have an opportunity to be standard bearers or leaders in the, in the fight against it. They also have an opportunity, they're, they're comfortable with big machinery, and so they're building giant surface water reservoirs. That's also a food sustainability question. You're taking land out of agricultural production to create a small reservoir so that you can have a risk-free water system for the rest of your farm. And so they're, they're, they're making those decisions, and hopefully in a way that allows farming to survive and thrive in those areas. So I hope that that's a good thing. It's also self-serving. I know it's self-serving for me to say that, so I, I don't know what the real answer is. Yeah. I appreciate that. Can I ask you a science question then? You go for it. So, okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Science question then. Um, with your flux towers, um, have you been able to observe um, changes in overnight temperatures associated with having inundated surfaces versus dry surfaces? I've heard of that in like Iowa, like, Chicago heat wave being exacerbated by inundated fields. Yeah, so so far we haven't seen those differences, but it's something we're really interested in. As I mentioned to me, yeah, um, we're not really seeing that. There is, in a big picture perspective, like the shift from like prairie to agriculture caused a massive change sure. in, in meteorology. We're basically like we delayed spring by a month and a half. So like April is way more sensible heat flux and less ET than there used to be. And now it's all in like April, May, June. So that's a shift that's big, but that's more on a regional level than on any one field. So Thank you. Yeah, so no one's unfortunately really adopting AWD. And so it's really cool that you have a big influx of money. What other um, ideas are there to get um, farmers to adopt these technologies? Do they need like demonstration farms or legal interventions? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I hope the money will help. I hope yeah. that some people will use the money to just do it. I hope some will use the money to implement those enabling, re-plumbing their fields and, and building better reservoirs or wells that allow tighter control over your water supply. Um, I hope that the demonstration aspect works, and it, it, it's alternate wetting and drying. I cannot tell you how many farmers have said, you know, I've accidentally done that. <laughs> it's, it's not easy to keep a field wet in Arkansas in the summer with those massive ET rates. And so if you can get them to remember that and say, you know, but that rice you still harvested pretty well, then you can kind of like, oh, okay, yeah, it can maybe work. So that, but I think the demonstration and the social acceptability of it also, that, that it's valued as a society, but it may also require our consumers and companies to help really incentivize it. But, but it is wild to hear farmers say, I will not do that. And so we have to, then let's promote um, furrow irrigation and let's promote some other practices. Maybe you can just, maybe you can be good by increasing the yield enough that you are kind of out chasing the methane that way. So the, the yield scaled emission rather than the um, area scaled emission can go down. Anyone's going to do it for rice, it's going to be you. Um, but yeah, let's go to hands to Ben. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Next week's speaker is uh, Joe Turk from the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He's being hosted by our faculty member here in AOS, Myra. Oh, yeah. He's going to talk about moisture in the lower free troposphere and an observational strategy for observing closely spaced vertical profiles in near convection. So we'll do more atmospheric talk uh, next week, and then we'll continue with the rest of our semester. So please do come next week and see you Tuesday at 4. Thank you.